Dr. Andrew Marganot, University of Illinois. Today I'm going to share with you some of our lab's results from a NREC funded project on slow release phosphorus. When I say slow release, I don't have in mind current main fertilizers on the market, but rather a novel emerging pea source that stands to meet crop demand in a higher synchrony than what we have right now as options, while also reducing phosphorus losses from fields into surface waters. So if this sounds too good to be true, well, maybe it is. There's always a catch. So our job with this NREC funding is to figure out what is the best way to integrate this slow-release phosphorus into Illinois cropping systems. A bit more about what fertilizer source I'm talking about. So struvite is the name of magnesium ammonium phosphate. It is derived from waste sources. So think here of things like ethanol plants, all of the waste from those plants, also wastewater treatment plants in cities. There's a lot of phosphate in those waters. What if we could tap into those waste streams, thereby decreasing point source losses of phosphorus, and then capitalize on it as a form of P input that not only serves to meet crop P demands, but can also provide benefits for meeting the nutrient loss strategy targets of reductions of phosphorus. So to do this, we've spent the last three years doing field trials and greenhouse work to quantify what is the amount of struvite that can be used in blends with other conventional phosphorus inputs. By that, I have in mind things like MAP and DAP. So what we found to date is that for the typical soil phosphorus conditions, we're talking STP concentrations of roughly 15 to 25 on a bray basis or uh, 25 to 30 ppm on a melic basis, that we can use struvite as a pea source without any crop yield penalty. We can fully swap out MAP and DAP and use this slow release phosphorus form. Now we don't see a yield bump, but the fact is that struvite can replace MAP and DAP from what we've seen thus far. And we have in mind here three crops that we've evaluated, corn, soybean, and wheat. What about the water quality benefits that we hypothesized? We found that with struvite, we tend to have lower soil test P values after we pull off the grain. So this would mimic, for example, you've harvested the crop and now you've got the winter rains, the spring rains, where you have susceptibility to runoff and leaching losses of phosphate. Well, having lower STP that remains in the soil because of the slow release nature of struvite means that we're less susceptible, less liable for those losses. This is good on two fronts. We keep more of that phosphate there for the crop for the next season, and we also mitigate the losses off farm of this nutrient. My lab has had the good fortune of getting additional support from NREC, and these funds are going to be going towards valorizing a soil archive that is 155 years old of soils across our state to quantify legacy phosphorus, and then to understand how we can update the Illinois Agronomy Handbook to be more up to date. Why are we doing this work? Well, about a year ago, I stumbled in a old shed at the South Farms on campus. It was gonna be bulldozed that following fall. And with the headlamp, I was looking at these old jars and my heart almost stopped as a soil scientist when I realized that these are samples that were sampled or taken as early as 1885 when the U of I was first founded as part of the initial soil survey. So this work came about for two reasons. Number one is that we wanted to tackle the question of legacy phosphorus. Legacy phosphorus is simply phosphorus that was added at some prior point in time to a given field. This could have been two years before or it could have been 150 years before. Typically, it refers to the latter, a longer term previous application. The reason why we care about legacy phosphorus is that current phosphorus losses to our state surface waters may have been from fertilizer that was applied 100 years ago or from soil erosion, regardless of how much phosphorus was added as a fertilizer. In other words, we may not be having accurate baselines or expectations on phosphorus loss reductions if we are not able to quantify the legacy piece of the puzzle. The second objective of this work is to update the Illinois Agronomy Handbook, specifically on the concept on soil phosphorus supply power. This concept refers to that the subsoil can have different amounts of phosphorus due to the natural inheritance from the glaciers of phosphorus stocks. 
Now we know that the subsoil pea supply power varies across our state because of the different patterns of glaciation. Currently the handbook has a somewhat amorphously defined subsoil pea supply power region. So we want to make this more accurate down to the county level. What can you expect for your subsoil pea supply power? This matters because it would, in, because it would help you interpret your soil test P values with respect to the subsoil supply power. So we can't travel back in time, but we can substitute these relic samples as a flashback to what soil P was like.